Today, Uncut is at the Quai d'Orsay in Paris to speak with the French Foreign Minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian. Jean-Yves Le Drian, qui réside ici au Quai d'Orsay. Jean-Yves Le Drian, who was a socialist, Jean-Yves Le Drian, who was defence minister under François Hollande, allied himself early with Emmanuel Macron. Today he resides in this palace as foreign minister. OK. OK, let's start. So, Minister, when you're sat in this building, you really have the impression that you're the foreign minister of a great nation. It's an historic place, and it was built at a moment when the Republic wanted to show that it was as powerful as rival kingdoms and empires. So something spectacular was needed, and that's what was built. Talking about power when one's already been defence minister, now foreign minister, for example, with NATO, you want to defend multilateral ideals, but we see on the other side of the Atlantic the president there sees things completely differently. How does that make you feel? Well, there's one thing that I think very deeply, and that is that President Trump is a coherent president. He's coherent? I find him coherent. Really? But I don't share his coherence. OK, OK, I agree with that. He's even very coherent. Ever since the start, he's engaged in a methodical destruction of all of multilateralism's regulatory tools that affect our lives and the planet. He started with the climate, then tore up the Vienna Nuclear Proliferation Agreement with Iran. He took the US out of UNESCO, and now he's going to take on human rights, human rights, and now he's embarking on what we call a trade war on multiple fronts with China, Canada, Mexico, and also the European Union. Now he's thinking about rowing back, but he also questions what role NATO should have. That's all coherent, because it all implies an America standing alone. It's not only America first, it's become America alone. An America engaged in a power struggle with everyone. As America is the stronger, he enters headfirst into every bilateral relationship to underline that superiority. So he wants the law of the jungle to apply. Certainly the strongest makes the law, yes, it's consistent and he's always said it and we shouldn't be surprised. He has this showman side, provocative, but deep down he's consistent. That raises questions in Europe, but it's all of a piece, entirely coherent, and that will continue to be the case as long as he's in power, it's an attitude that finds an echo in many Americans. I'm sure it does, but now as the head of French diplomacy, your job is to make deals, compromise and discuss matters. How do you go about that? Do you listen, nod your head and then go away and think about something else? We have to continue to talk. This is what happened at the NATO summit. On security, we came to an agreement, despite everything. The situation allowed the identity identification of weaknesses in our security system which could not be ignored, and that spurred the concept of European defence. So we have to talk, and if needs be, take advantage of this power relationship. OK, but for example, when he attacks Germany, well, of course, we have to defend Germany. And that's done via relationships? What we say and what we do, especially in France's case, is to repeat, and President Macron has done it several times, that our destinies are linked. When you strike one, you strike the other. And when you reinforce one, you reinforce the other as well. 
When you put one into doubt, the other is put in doubt too. In this global situation, when everything seems open to question and great powers throw their weight around, as we're talking about this place and powers, we see that it's absolutely essential for the Franco-German couple to strengthen relations, as they will become the world's sole stable core, maybe around this core, and these initiatives, a refounded Europe may emerge in the future, and a refounded Europe will become the global reference. We'll be getting to Europe in a minute, but I have a final question. As a diplomat, as head of diplomacy, isn't it personally discouraging, discouraging to be faced with a man who says more or less any old thing, even if it is coherent? It's coherent nonsense. No, it's just coherent. Trump is taking an isolationist line, and that has historically happened before. America first is not a new idea. For diplomats, it's more about new demands, a new set of rules for which we have to modify our models and change our parameters. Okay. We have to think differently and accept the reality. A major player is systematically unpicking everything that made up the fabric of what we call multilateralism. We have to create a new multilateralism, including our relations with the US. Now we've reached the point where, to create an opposing force to the Americans, Europe's being talked about. But Europe isn't in a good state right now. It isn't well placed, but it can get better. It can? Yes. Because what's happening with the commercial war, with these questions about security and the challenges facing us, like migration, the ecological transition, terrorism, or the digital economy, there's only one solution. Le défi de la transition écologique, le défi du terrorisme, le défi du numérique, pour répondre à ce défi-là, il n'y a qu'une solution. Yes, objectively we're in agreement, but in practice, in practical terms, the retreat into nationalism that some in Europe want to promote and cultivate will lead to chaos with no project for the future. I have a very clear example. Go on. When the new Italian government wants to develop a logical approach to immigration, saying, for example, we'll ban it, and saying, it's not our job, it's someone else's, and then goes and talks to the Austrians or other populists, they can't agree. Even with fellow populists, there's no agreement. So that ends up with total isolation. That's not a European project, and it's no way to meet the challenges we face. Yes, but are we not faced with the force that also, in fact, wants to pick Europe apart because Europe doesn't interest them? It even gets in their way. European unity would be a counterforce, but within that block there are those who would take it apart. Yesterday, that's true. And there are those who would maintain a united Europe, like France, and maybe today Spain. Yes, Spain, Germany, Portugal. At the end of the day, there are plenty of members, including the founders, ready to fight for Europe. Yes, but Italy is a little bit more complicated. Except Italy. Although, nonetheless, we have to do everything we can to keep Italy on side, despite everything, despite the opposition. Rejecting Italy won't help rebuild Europe. We have to convince all Europeans, not just governments, that the only way to cope with all the challenges ahead of security, of the struggles in our daily lives, is a reinforced Europe, a stronger Europe, that's ready to use that strength. Those peddling the illusion that nation states can fold back on themselves and prosper are leading us towards chaos and shipwreck. But on the immigration question, the populists have won. Europe is closing the doors. The common policy is now to say they can stay in Libya, or they can go back, and we don't care how. We don't try to understand what's happening there or what the conditions in Libya are like. All that matters is that they don't cross the Mediterranean. My analysis isn't so radical. Firstly, because the big surge was in 2015 after the crises in the Middle East in particular, but also in Africa. Since then, the flows have been much smaller, in part due to European policies enacted at the time. A political crisis is now underway, where some Europeans use migration as a lever to build a different Europe, a more isolationist Europe. The populists have repeatedly hit the panic button, saying migration would explode Europe. Les populistes, l'Europe allait 
exploded. But Europe hasn't exploded. Yes, but Europe hasn't exploded because it's lowered itself to their level. I disagree. The European Council in June fixed a triple principle based on responsibility, solidarity and humanity. Qui repose sur la solidarité et qui repose sur l'humanisme, sur l'humanité. La responsibility comes from the fact that Europe's member states cannot exist without controlling the situation. Humanity, once the Aquarius reached Valencia, may be. Why couldn't it dock in Bastia? Why did it have to go all the way to Valencia? Why couldn't the French or German refugee services do their jobs there? Why were they not processed in Italy, first of all? People have to live up to their responsibilities. I think that's a little simplistic. Fair enough, 1-0. First you have to say maybe even 2-0. All right, that's the final score, OK. Afterwards, there was also Malta's position. There was an interim period before today's situation where the framework agreed at June's Council of Ministers is operational. That's the three-tiered approach I have already talked about with simultaneous border protection protection and action taken in the countries of origin. But do you fail to understand the Italians? For years we gave them no help, just repeating Dublin, Dublin. And they replied, the refugees don't arrive in Dublin, they're landing in Lampedusa. There wasn't the solidarity we needed then. That's true. Indeed it is. That's why we need to find some. This partially explains why they take this line. So we have to find some sort of European solidarity. Aquarius revealed this, as did Lifeline in Malta. It could happen again tomorrow, in a completely different situation where European solidarity, taking into account what is possible, ensures that asylum seekers are first identified and then shared out among member states according to their capacities. But that's not the most important element. The essential thing is that the right of European asylum is clear-cut and clearly stated, and that the cooperation and solidarity processes can be accepted by all. So I'm not convinced this is a step back. OK, I'd like to conclude by wondering, we always say that to solve the problem we have to tackle the problem at its source. In other words, in the countries people are fleeing from. In Africa, for example. We've been saying that for 150 years, since I've been in politics. I hear the phrase all the time. We never see any results. Where's the problem? Why is nothing working? What is French foreign ministry policy doing to make it work, at least in one place? What's being done to offer migrants some sort of future at home? The big difference, the two big differences compared to what was being said 30 or 40 years ago, is that, first of all, for a long time, where Africa was concerned, we were focused on compassion and humanitarian action. The other aspect is demographic. Population growth today is much larger. The response to this is economic. In other words, instead of having an attitude towards African economic development founded on solidarity and humanitarian ideals, we have to establish strong economic programs in harness with the political class to encourage human development and encourage populations to stay put because there are jobs. This has begun, so it's an entirely new dimension involving much larger investments. This is the new logic that needs to be applied, and I think it's taking off because there's been a cultural shift in Africa as well as in Europe. Is this a purely French approach, or is this logic? being applied to European policy. It's becoming European policy. To what extent? It's being set up progressively, and the intervention fund is being coordinated by the EU's member states. But it's also becoming European policy because initiatives are being taken according to the economic opportunities. So, for example, Germany takes on the economic development of Mali or Niger, and this is the big new thing. To conclude, what's the most fascinating job? Defence Minister or Foreign Minister? They're very different. Foreign Minister is naturally more global and finds itself more in the centre of things, dangerous events or moments full of potential. It's also a job with a lot of talking, negotiating, initiating. 
forecasting and exchanging. On négocie, on initie, on projette, euh, on échange. Defence Minister is much more about rapid reaction in times of war, and I prefer peace to war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm in Santander, where I'm going to speak to the Spanish Foreign Minister, Josep Borrell. Josep Borrell. Josep Borrell is here because during the summer he teaches at the university, giving classes on migration and migratory problems. As always, we present the interview uncut. Welcome, Mr. Borrell. You've now been foreign minister for three months in the Sanchez government, and this summer you took part in a conference on the new European Spring. As Spain's foreign minister, do you really see a European Spring pointing towards the future? I think it could happen. I think Trump's shock to the system is a chance for Europe to redefine itself and take a leap forward. When I read the French president's address to his ambassadors, I think France is taking this line. Germany too. Ah yes, everyone is telling us Trump is a stroke of luck, but on the other hand, an opportunity, an opportunity then. But are Europeans ready? Who among the Europeans is ready to seize this opportunity or face up to the challenge of Trump? Not all Europeans are the same. In Europe, you have people like Mr. Salvini, for example, and then you have Mr. Sanchez, for example, who is not at all representing the same thing. Yes, and there's Mr. Orban or the Poles. So let's start with Spain and the new Spanish government. How does the Spain of today, through its foreign minister, perceive the crisis in global multilateralism? The priority for Spain's foreign policy is to build a stronger, more sovereign Europe. It may even be its very own political project. The liberal multilateral world order we thought we were living in, we now discover may not have been as liberal as ordered, or as multilateral as we thought. Spain really sees a chance to build a new multilateralism out from under the American umbrella. Without being under the American umbrella could mean, for example, as the French president proposed, a European army in the future? A European strategic capacity, yes. That would include a military capacity as well. But that means that today a certain number of member states have to ask themselves once again, what price national sovereignty within European sovereignty? National sovereignty must not vanish because nation-states, and the French know this very well, must survive. But common capacities are needed to allow us to have real sovereignty. Can you imagine what would have happened after Trump's tweets to the Peseta? He tanked the Turkish lira, and he could have made any other national European currency plunge. Yes, I entirely agree. So the euro is a common capacity for Europe, it's true, even though over the past five years it's been increasingly criticised. It is perhaps harmful for some nations. Does this debate exist in Spain? Yes, because Spain has suffered, not as much as Greece, but we suffered. 
Many of the austerity policies we used to tackle the euro crisis were not tackling a euro crisis at all. It was called a euro crisis, but it wasn't. Just imagine if we had not had the euro, just how much weaker each of us would have been. The building of the euro is incomplete, and in this domain, France and Germany have already taken the first steps, and Spain will be beside them. Spain will join them to, for example, support the idea of a European finance minister, a eurozone budget. That would be an extension of the logic behind the euro. Once the train has left the station, the carriages have to follow. The euro is an unfinished project. We can't just have the euro, it has to be accompanied with all the other usual elements found in monetary unions. So a political capacity? A political capacity and a financial capacity that we have already begun to build. Who would have thought that in 2010 and 2011, when the crisis broke, a half a billion euro cushion would be made available? It's not enough, but it's a lot more than we had at the time. We have to continue along the lines of building an institutional system alongside the single currency. That's all very good. But when we see the incapacity of the Europeans, and here I'm speaking to Spain's foreign minister, their incapacity to collectively manage problems or to take a common view on what is Europe's single biggest problem today, migrants and refugees, there's little reason to be optimistic. We need to be active because really there needs to be the will, the will to do something. We mustn't be pessimistic or optimistic. We must take action. We have to engage. It is true that we do not have the means to solve the migration problem. When we both sat in the European Parliament, we were already talking about that. But it is getting more and more serious. It's not just something that comes and goes, and it will be with us for a long time. We have to agree. If the 27 member states cannot, we would at the very least need enhanced cooperation between nine member states. Migration divides Europe, and it has the potential to do more damage to the European Union than the euro. The euro crisis was in fact a crisis of institutional finance. Migration is much more serious as it affects identity, culture, living together. You don't fix that with a few extra billion euros. I hope that in Salzburg, a core number of countries, we can't expect unanimity, will declare themselves ready to do something together. I won't be there, but just imagine Salzburg at the summit under the Austrian presidency. A presidency not really looking for a European solution. If you consider, for example, the Prime Minister's comments about closing all European ports to refugees, which is legally impossible and in any case just nuts, it could end in discord. It could end with a rupture between members or a half-baked compromise that no one understands. Est-ce qu'il va y avoir une rupture entre les pays ou il y avoir un compromis au rabais qu'on ne comprendra pas A cut price compromise won't work anymore. These sorts of compromises cannot work in the cold light of reality. What does reality tell us? It tells us the Dublin Treaty is dead. We need to explain Dublin. It was sold as the magic potion and we believed it. The countries where refugees landed became responsible for them, for their welfare and the processing of their asylum demands. So the Greeks, Italians and Spanish ended up paying for the rest of Europe. Dublin was a way for Northern Europe to tell Southern Europe, sort it out yourselves. But that's only possible if the problem is manageable. When it begins to be too big, we can't say, it's up to you. In fact, Aquarius landing in Valencia signed Dublin's death warrant, in practical terms. 
In fact, when the ship arrived, French immigration officials were on hand to ensure a fair sharing out of the refugees. The final nail in Dublin's coffin. Exactly. We didn't ask them all if they wanted asylum in Spain. We each took around half, and each group asked for asylum in each country. So Spain and France didn't apply Dublin. Listen, I really hope we don't end up with a cheap compromise, but it will divide us, no doubt. We won't convert Mr. Orban or Mr. Salvini. They won't agree with Mr. Sanchez or Mrs. Merkel. No way. I hope this won't happen, but I do hope that at least part of Europe will be capable of setting up strategic capacities that can cope with this migratory flow and share the burden. Why is Italy becoming Eurosceptic? Among other reasons is the fact we left Italy alone for years to deal with the wave of migration. It's true, we repeatedly told them Dublin, Dublin, and they retorted, but they're arriving in Lampedusa, not Dublin. Why do you keep on insisting on Dublin all the time? It's your problem. Yes, exactly, sort it out. Only when we look at what's happened in Spain in the last few weeks after Aquarius was welcomed in Valencia, which was good, a symbol, a strong symbol, a second ship docked, then a third, but by the fourth, Spain cried, this can't continue, because in one fell swoop, Spain had become Europe's front door and ran the risk of facing Italian-scale problems. In its turn, Spain was told to sort it out, and that's the problem. Today, I don't see the countries ready to enhance cooperation to tackle the migration problem. I think that between Spain, Germany, France and Portugal, there are possibilities. That's quite a few countries, France, Germany, Spain and Portugal. Portugal's a country that has made a success story out of immigration, that has a left-wing government. I think there are others who could join up. If we really can't do anything, then we should just stop all the smooth talk. Do you think that on European questions, a left-wing government or a liberal centrist government like, say, in France, or a mixed government like in Germany, can mean anything? Can we say Europe's following left-wing or right-wing policies? Because both are needed. Is that possible? There have to be issues on which diametrically opposed governments can agree. Migration is pure acid for Europe and could dissolve the Union. In the next elections, it is clear two camps will face each other, two visions of Europe. One of a Europe open to the world and capable of managing migratory flows. Whether we want them or not, they are coming and we need them. The other is a vision of a closed Europe, refusing entry and fortress-like. Josep Borrell, you sat in the European Parliament, you were previously a minister in Spain and now foreign minister. Which was the job you liked the most? Or which was the one that scared you the most? The job I have now. Really? Oh yes, no contest. Why? Because the world is a lot more complicated, a lot more dangerous. How does a meeting of Europe's foreign ministers work? For me it's a sort of... We cry together. We cry together at the unhappiness of the world. It's a sort of grim catwalk of the world's problems. Do you manage to do anything? We manage to cry. We manage to regret. We manage to issue condemnations. We manage to mobilize humanitarian aid resources. We bandage wounds like in Somalia or Mali or Yemen, in all countries in need. There are regrettably many of them where humanity suffers. Could we do more? We should, but we don't have the political will. We don't have the political will, therefore Europeans don't. It's not a problem of means, so is it a problem of will? I think our capacities far exceed our desire. Why is that? What's missing to mobilize the will to make a difference? We don't have the same visions of the world. Is it really that that weakens Europe today? 
Yes, without a doubt. We don't have the same vision. To a certain degree, it's normal. History has made us all different. And certain countries have very different governments. Well, Uncut has run out of time, as nothing is edited. So thank you very much. Thank you. Until the next time. So that's the end of this edition with the two foreign ministers of France and Spain, Mr. Jean-Yves Le Drian and Mr. Joseph Borrell. See you for the next Uncut. I'm Daniel Cohen-Bendit. Goodbye and thank you.